right, thank you very much, uh, both to Veronica and Alex for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be speaking here. So <coughs> my talk will have both a part about um, algebra, so that's sort of the quantum, and a second part which is more about the geometry Um, so in particular about a certain HM fiber slash affine Springer fiber. And then Last, I want to say a few words about some combinatorics that comes up, which may be of some interest. All right, so the algebra part is about a finite dimensional algebra called the small quantum group. So what is it? Well, so you have some finite dimensional complex semi-simple Lie algebra. To this uh, you attach its universal enveloping algebra. Now, Lustig, and while well, building on many, many other people's work, built a certain cute affirmation of this algebra. So, I'll directly talk about what's called Lustig's integral form. So this will have similar generators to my UG, but now I also include some kind of divided powers of them and so on. These will satisfy analogs of the relations here. But the point is that this is an algebra over C QQ inverse. So in particular, you can specialize this Q to be something like a root of unity. And there, new representation theory appears. So I'm going to fix this zeta to be some L through of unity. And this L will have some conditions. So let's say it doesn't divide the Coxer number or Coxer number plus one and maybe need to say that it's good, whatever. You can really ignore these conditions. So, um, I define the specialization by just sending um, to the zeta. Another point is that here there's some finite dimensional subalgebra called the small quantum group, or sometimes restricted. Um, so why would you care about such a thing? Well, So in some precise sense, uh, 
you can understand the representations of this u zeta g by understanding the representation category of this u zeta. And let me stop writing g times then just say kind of the ordinary characteristic zero representation theory of this group here. So this is kind of the interesting part. Um, it's not semi-simple. And say appears in a lot of recent work about like non-semi-simple TQFT. You can try to construct um, three manifold invariants using this category. So that, that's like one reason to care. All right, so a natural question when you want to start understanding the representation theory of any algebra is to compute its center. Um, so what does it mean to compute? First of all, we'd like to understand, in this case, since it's finite dimensional, what is the dimension? Um, what's the algebra structure? Maybe if you have some extra structure like gradings, okay, and not much has been understood about this. So, oh, I should say, let me write down here that all of what I'm talking about today is joined. with uh, Anna Lachowska. And uh, Nicolas Emesoy. Right. Um, so here's an example. So if your group is just SL2 and L is some odd prime, then the dimension of the Z U zeta will be 3L minus 1 over 2. Okay, so this number may not mean anything to you, maybe you shouldn't. Um, but the point is that this was for a long time like kind of the only known example and this is around the time when people were really into quantum groups. So Lustig defined this in uh, I think 90 or at least the small version. So what, what do you mean by dimension? So this is a finite dimensional C algebra. So just oh. me vector space dimension. Oh. Yeah. All right. So so there's a fact, which is that this group acts on the center, and. What I want to discuss for the rest of this talk is um, sort of a dimension formula for this G invariant part. And in this case, when I have SL2 or if I have any SLN, it's expected that this is all of the center. Um, okay, so. Our work heavily builds on a conjecture, unfortunately, still a conjecture, um, of the 
Bezrukovnikov Boyshed Alvarez Sean and Vasco So if you were here last summer, uh, there was a talk by Sean about their conjecture, which I will recall in the next section. So it has to do with some geometry. So you can compute this dimension of the invariant part. And it will turn out to be some combinatorial number. So I'll write the general case um, and then tell you, say, what it looks like for SLN. So recently there's been a lot of work on what's called like kind of rational Catalan combinatorics. Um, and That sort of depends on some slope, hence the rational. So two, say, co-prime integers. Okay, and this number is defined as the product over, say, fundamental invariance. So this is like the degree. some fundamental invariance, so think like symmetric functions in type E. Okay. So when G equals SLN, then this number It's just the following kind of Catalan number. This should be reminding you of maybe like fusion algebras, things like that. And this formula was conjectured by Igor Frankel around 2016. So I think this was in discussions with Anna and uh, Chiyu, her co-author. So let me first tell you what the kind of proof strategy is and then move on to the geometry. So this representation category We'll split as a direct sum of blocks um, and these blocks will be indexed by the following kind of set. So I take the co-weight lattice, I act on it by the so-called l dilate dot action of the affine wild group. It gives me some finite number of orbits. If you are seeing like characteristic p representation theory then it's like standard fare. If you haven't, uh, you shouldn't sort of worry too much about this. So soon I'm going to ignore uh, most of what I'm saying right now. So the idea is to compute what these distinct blocks will look like or the centers of those. And here, by the way, so when I say uh, 
I want to understand the center of this algebra that's the same as understanding the center of uh, this category of representations here. So there's something kind of drive you could do, take like Hochschild cohomology. Um, and there is some work by Anna and Chiu on this, but it's harder, so I don't want to say anything. Um, okay. So let me move on to the geometry. So the idea is as follows. So say you want to understand some representation category, not for the quantum group, but just say like the good old Lie algebra. Um, Austin, maybe I have a question. If, uh, yeah, please. So it's, uh, it, well this formula you said is it's, uh, direct some decomposition, decomposition of the categories, right? So they, for different lambda, they just don't talk to each other. That's right. No harm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, can you say a little more what you mean by center of this, uh, each one of these ref? So I mean take like endomorphisms of some like identity object ah, okay. in there. Yeah. I have a very basic question. Please. This quantum group, which I don't know anything about, so some Hopf algebra. <coughs> exactly. So the point is that some kind of canonical Hopf algebra attached to, uh, let's say, a root system and a prime number. And when you say representation, that's the representation as yeah, as half algebras in, in this case. Yeah. yeah, I'm being intentionally vague there. That that's why I said. And the center means uh, center as an algebra, like kernel of the adjoint action. So there's a theorem of Branda and Stroppel which says that to understand, well, what's called say parabolic category O, which I won't tell you anything about, you should just think of this some nice representation category for uh, this UG. Maybe I should say Z on this side. And this, as an algebra, is controlled by some space. So the space here is a Springer fiber. I.e. take some null point element. And attach to that there's a collection of all the Borel subalgebras in this G containing your mu. But these are some nice like singular spaces whose cohomology turns out to control uh, much about these categories. So the vague intuition is to affinize the setup. And then, of course, everything gets harder. So what do I mean by affinize? So in a long series of papers, um, the end of 80s and uh, beginning of 90s, Krishna Lustig told you that to understand modules or say this quantum and enveloping algebra, a root of unity, um, you can instead try to understand, um, let, me, well, let me just write kappa there, um, modules for the affine Lie algebra that are smooth in some appropriate sense. 
So in particular, like this quantization of unity is analogous to affinizing at some like rational level. The other thing, instead of just looking at like say representation categories of this thing here, on the Springer fiber side, we should replace this by an affine Springer fiber. And here, these will be just given by something like null planar orbits. I'll tell you more about the parameter set here. So it's much more complicated. But what I'll end up doing is just pick a particular element. So let me tell you a little bit about this parameter set and what it means. Um, let's say I look at the Loopy algebra of this G. Now, what I want to restrict to are, say, regular semi simple elements here. So if you want to think of this, um, In some simple example, think of G being GLN. You can take characteristic polynomials of such matrices, and what this gives you is essentially some like two variable polynomial. So this is some kind of a local spectral curve. And what I'm going to sort of use here is, is that there's a relation between these local things to global things. So let me first define what the affine Springer fiber itself is. So I pick some element in my loop Lie algebra. And I do the following. So there's this map. So O here will just be a Taylor series in, in T. So you can evaluate at zero. And in here, if I take the Borel subalgebra, I get some subalgebra inside my loop group called an Iwahori. So you should think of this as analogous to the usual construction of Springer fibers if you've ever seen it. I'll call this SP gamma tilde. And it'll be the following subset of the affine flag variety. So what is the affine flag variety? Some infinite dimensional space that you can think of as the analog of like, well, just the flag variety in a finite type. Let me say a few words about uh, Hitchin fibers. So I'm actually going to need some like variant of Hitchin fibers, but first recall that 
what's the HM moduli space? So in Josh's talk, we saw that consists of some Higgs bundle, so E and some Higgs field. So for me, E will be a G bundle um, phi will be some L-valued Higgs field, L just like some line bundle of high enough degree. Um, so not, not this like, say, cotangent bundle case we heard about. And I take some analog of this Hitchin map. So it's not an integrable system anymore. You can still make sense of the map. Um, Oscar, is this a bundle on, on this like a uh, formal function phase? No, so yeah, I should say that. So here, fix x to be some base curve. You can indeed think of it as a formal disk as well. Um, that, that's all. The sort of only thing that's going to play a role here, but the point is that um, there's a theorem essentially due to Ngo and Lamont to say that to understand the fibers of this map along like some part of the space, which includes like a huge part of the discriminant locus, but not say zero. Um, so if I let M be, be the fiber of this map, um, this will have some action of some uh, big algebraic group. So say when your spectral curve is smooth, then it's just like some analog of the Picard of the spectral curve. And what they tell you is that this quotient essentially looks like, I need some assumptions here to make this completely precise, but. It looks like, so meaning it is homeomorphic to a product of some kind of local Hitchin fibers like this. Mod maybe again some local symmetry groups. But what these guys turn out to be are exactly these affine Springer fibers. So this SP gamma without the tilde is some version where I put, instead of I, I put a G O there. Um, okay, but basically to understand these kind of singular Hitchin fibers, well, in like a very rough sense, you're, you're reduced to understanding basically a finite collection kind of indexed by singularities on your spectral curve. And again, you know, like when I say spectral curve, I'm thinking of G being like GLN again. Everything here with more words makes sense for other G as well. So, so here should I be thinking of the product of, uh, of the points where the X field is ramified? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so basically all, all of these uh, factors for like most points will just be points, so they don't really contribute. So think of this as like a finite product. Mm -hmm. And the Higgs field is only allowed to be tamely ramified? Yes, so I mean, I, I do allow poles given by some 
line bundle, so they could be like of a arbitrary high order. Uh, and this does imply, you know, like I really can allow my gamma to have sort of um, arbitrarily high powers of T, say. Is this uh, SP tilde or just, uh, just P tilde? Yeah, over there. So th this is SP gamma, and like I said, so this is like. No, this is this is the version where instead of uh, this i, I take the loop group, and I mod out by like the arc group. So some kind of like spherical version of this. Essentially, like some kind of local compactified Jacobian saying type A. All right, but but I really I'm really gonna use like the sp gamma tilde. That that's why I introduced it first. So so let me now take gamma to be the following. So take s times t, where t is just the uniformizer, and s. Is some element in the carton that's regular. Um, then the big conjecture of these four people says the following. So it says that Basically, the principal block, so kind of the biggest block that I had in the decomposition, it's invariant part. And now I'll do a bit of slate of hand here, so I'll put a check here. So when you go to geometry, there's always kind of Langlands geology involved, but feel free to ignore that. So this, as a ring, will be given by the uh, cohomology of this affine Springer fiber. But then I also have taken variants for some kind of canonical affine wild group action, which comes from essentially like this thing having a big centralizer in the loop group, and then the fact that I can vary this S in a family. And you can imagine that there is some form of the statement. So, for singular blocks, you have to replace this by taking sort of further invariants or anti invariants. And you can even bundle them up into a single space, which is exactly what Pong, say, did uh, last summer in, in, in her talk. But I don't really want to get into that since it doesn't uh, make much of a difference for me. What is T? So T um, is just the uniformizer in, in, in the field of Laurent series over C. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, I think I'm now confused how gamma depends on L. It doesn't, that's the point. So if I, if I put a, a zero there, so I only look at this um, principal block, then it turns out that the result's independent of L. It really actually turns out all these blocks are basically. So only the way you sum them up in this decomposition will then involve L, which you see here in this formula, say. So this is... Um, I think due to Anderson, Janssen, and Circle, this independence of L result. Um, right. So, let me state what these sort of workhorse. Lemma here is um, 
So this is due to uh, Boixard Alvarez and also it uses some representation theory of like say Cherenic algebras which we secretly saw a little bit in the previous talk by Maxime. So if I take the cohomology of this particular affine Springer fiber and take the invariant part this, so it turns out this comes with actually two actions of the finite wall group. So as W representations, this will look like the following. So you take uh, the co-root lattice and you mod out by n plus one, or let's say h plus one, this is the Coxner number, times the co-root lattice. So if you've ever seen, uh, again, like, say, Verlinde algebra, things like that, this shouldn't be so surprising. But it's clear that the dimension of this, which is n plus 1 to the rank Oh, gee, and I keep saying n because I'm thinking of SLN. And the other key lemma um, that follows from sort of their uh, alternative description is that If I take sort of anti-invariance for some fixed lambda, which will be some kind of parabolic subgroup of this, for the other action, then I get almost what's here, but let me denote it by drw w lambda, and this is exactly where the sort of representation theory of triadic algebra steps in. So just think of this as kind of taking anti-invariance in this module. You know, it's something you compute fairly explicitly. In particular, you can understand what the dimension is. Um, this is sometimes called Gordon's canonical quotient. of what's called the diagonal co-invariant ring. So this is defined as taking kind of a doubled version of the carton and modding out by the positive degree invariance, okay? So, so it turns out this, this itself is kind of the wrong dimension. So there is some canonical, like slightly smaller quotient ring in general. So for, say again, type A, it's everything involved heavily in like Heyman's work on Hilbert schemes of points on C2. Um, I should also say that it comes with two gradings. So an important sort of um, part of the story that I don't know how much time I'll have to sort of talk about 
is understanding the gratings on the center. Um, so then this conjecture here is completely kind of ungraded, but here there's at least a cohomological grading you could look at. Um, and it turns out that there's more. So let me say like a few words about uh, the bigrading here. So So unfortunately, uh, mostly I like kind of made progress with the type A case. So let's just assume that G is SLN. So in this case, um, you can do the following. So. So I want to find one of these MBs and let me now call this MB tilde. So it will be analogous to this M, but instead it's going to live in some kind of parabolic uh, hitch in vibration. So this is say E and phi as before, but now I fix some point on the curve and on that point some Borel reduction. Um, I call it Ex. So you want to find such a fiber such that the cohomology, and again there's some group acting here, actually gives you back what you want. That you can't quite do. Uh, you end up with something a bit worse, which is this SP gamma tilde mod some lattice action. So here, there's always some big kind of lattice coming from the centralizer of gamma acting freely on this SP gamma tilde. This is also due to Kajdan Lustig. Okay, but the point is that this contains, if I say some results of Goreski, Kotwitz, and McPherson, let me write this Tor formula here. You, you can really kind of ignore this if you want, but, but the point is that um, you look at the cohomology of the big thing. So if there's a free abelian group acting here it's of course like some infinite type thing. But just understand that as a module for the slide section. Um, and in particular this will contain what I want. All right, um, so the upshot here after you've done this, so I won't tell you how to do it. Uh, basically, you need to find some spectral curve that's irreducible, only has a unique singularity of the relevant type. By the way, what, what is the singularity? So. so say this S 
looks like. Kind of what we had in uh, Josh's talk yesterday was something like this. And then the characteristic polynomial gamma will be like t of the n minus x of the n is 0. So this is like n lines intersecting on a plane. This is the local picture of, of your spectral curve. And then maybe you know, has some genus and so on uh, elsewhere. But the point is that in this formula, like o only one of these factors will really contribute anything. So it's not so trivial to uh, actually find such a thing. But the upshot after you've done it is that you can define what's called a perverse filtration. Now, it's sort of impossible to compute anything about this per filtration. So I think um, I don't want to say more about this second grading. Let me just give you an example where you can compute everything kind of explicitly. So if x is p1, I say this line bundle is. something like this, then your sp gamma tilde will look like this kind of, well, sp gamma tilde will actually look like some infinite chain of projective lines, so let me mod out by this quotient. This is this kind of banana curve. And the invariant part of this cohomology here will actually look like the cohomology of some degeneration of this. So you degenerate that one cycle, we get some guy like this, which is turns out to be an other Fi Springer fiber, maybe a bit better behaved. Um, and you can write down the bigrading uh, here. So it's something like this. So here's homological, here's this perverse. And let me just say that, say, if you do this for SL3, this guy will have a component that, that's a P1 bundle over a P2 blown up at three points. We'll have another component that's uh, just the flag variety of SL3 and we'll have four more components. And they intersect in some like horrible way. So it's very complicated space, which like it's very hard to get your hands on. Uh. Are you saying that's some canonical splitting of the professor's filtration? So it's pretty non-obvious, but uh, it, it turns out there is. So you can understand this per filtration by looking at instead kind of Hilbert schemes of points on these spectral curves. And it's a theorem of Jürgen Rennemann, who like 
essentially it looks at this case. So like to transport it back here, actually, I, I think it's a bit tricky. So maybe I shouldn't say that as a theorem. At least uh, in some simpler case like this, it is true that the filtration split is given by some kind of number of points grading on the Hubbard scheme. Okay. So finally, let me say maybe a few words about uh, the actual dimension formula here. So, so here it's dimension three. You can refine it to this kind of one, one, one uh, picture. However, that turns out to be quite hard. So. Let me say a few words about how you use now this combinatorics. So say again, G is SLN, and I want to show this proof because you know, like for some people, I think it may be interesting to know what what's going on. So the dimension of this dr w lambda w will essentially be given by the inner product of some like symmetric functions let's say a q equals t equals 1 it's a very hard theorem of carlson milli called the shuffle theorem which tells you kind of what the bigrade structure here is so this i'm not using some kind of canon to kill a fly if i were to quote gabriella uh, this is like some, some much easier symmetric function. I'm just writing it this way when I said uh, q equals t equals 1. But now you can also understand this as follows. So you're computing the dimension of invariance in some space. And what this space turns out to be is actually, again, just well up to some sign twist. This kind of module. And now, in addition to this work, Melit has computed some kind of bigrade version of of not just this, but some kind of rational versions. So let me call those just CQ mod LQ. So L could be any number that's co-prime to say N. And what this is equal to is not this nabla EN, instead it's, it's called PM over N dot one from a pm comma n. So what's pm comma n? So it's an operator in something called the elliptic Hall algebra. Again, you don't really need any of these EHA theory for understanding kind of this combinatorics, but since that's sort of like the first proof I came up with, I think it's kind of interesting and suggests that you can maybe generalize this somehow. So what you end up computing um, is something like this. So you just pair these two guys together. So what this PMN does is it takes this one, which is, you treat as a symmetric function, acts on some kind of Fox space, and produce you know, like some other big symmetric function again. 
So this pairing, again, maybe up to some sine twist, equals this dimension of the invariant part of the center, assuming this BBISB conjecture. So then you can put this to a computer or think about it for a while. Uh, and for example, a funny thing that happens, you need to assume L doesn't divide, here I should say it's really L, um, L doesn't divide H plus one because in the proof I need to use the Chinese remainder theorem <laughs> to say C of Q mod LQ tensor C of Q mod N plus one Q equals C of uh, something like this. Okay, so finally maybe I should say um, a bit more about, since this is about quantum geometry, uh, about relationships between these things to say other topics in this conference. So, so up there I drew those n lines intersecting on a plane. So these did come up in uh, at least Gabriela's talk. So you can think of them as giving you some kind of link of a singularity. And what this will be is the following kind of pure braid closed up in standard way. So this is the full twist which I probably fucked up in, in this drawing, but whatever. Uh, this is the link of the spectral curves I see and call C gamma. And actually this homology or cohomology here turns out to be closely related to some kind of homological invariant of this link. So I don't want to make a precise statement just because it would take too long to state. But for example, on the other side of Nanabila and Hodge, there's also something that computes that same invariant and it'd be great to understand sort of what's the precise relation there and also to the quantum group side. So this is probably a good place to stop. Any questions or comments? Is there a local version of P equal W? Well, that's maybe my question to you. <laughs> so, that would be great. But uh, as far as I know, no. Uh, the impression I get is you need to do some kind of trickier things on the Hitchin base to get the right si sort of Betty objects. To, yeah. We can discuss more though if, if you want. <laughs> So maybe building on that. So yeah. as long as I understand, when you embed, um, when you find this Hitchin fiber, you're, you, so you globalize it to some curve, yeah. and then you obtain this reverse filtration. So can you show at least that the filtration is independent? Yes, so this is a theorem of uh, Mali Kengun and Mira Nishenda. So essentially you need this Hitchin base to be big enough for your family to be versatile. And that's basically going to ensure that, say, the total space is smooth and, you know, you get all these beautiful results about perverse sheaves uh, on the base. So, yes, you certainly need something like this. It also complicates a little bit about studying this degeneration here that... Uh, any other questions? If not, let's find Oscar again.